Amen, amen. Praise the name of the Lord. The book of Acts chapter 2, reading with verse 1. So thankful for all of our children, aren't you? Would you give them a hand? I know they're going to their class tonight. They call it Power Hour. We're so thankful for all of our children, amen. We are. We've got a lot of great, great kids in the church, and I'm thankful. I am continuing the series here tonight and um, in Acts chapter 2. And from the verse in Hebrews 11, we've been talking about faith as a substance. When faith comes in the room, you can feel it. Faith comes in your heart, you can feel it. It's tangible. How many know that? And so I'm continuing that tonight going to the book of Acts and the reason we're going to the book of Acts because James said show me your faith without your works I will show you my faith by my works faith is real until you don't act on it when you act on it it becomes very very powerful you remember that faith without works is dead being alone but when faith is responded to something powerful happens you can believe it's going to heal you But when he looked at the man at the pool of Bethesda and said, go wash your eyes in the pool of Siloam and you'll be healed, he he could have said, I believe you. But if he would have never done what he told him to do, his faith caused him to be obedient. You've purified your souls in obeying the gospel. When you obeyed, something supernatural happened. So here it is, the book of Acts. The book of Acts are the actions or the works. You saw what happened when they operated in faith by doing. Go. And what will happen to the goer, to the doer? These signs shall follow them that believe. Miracles follow those that respond in faith or respond to faith. Somebody say amen. So tonight, the book of Acts chapter 2, reading with verse 1, it says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, They were all with one accord in one place. Everybody say unified. They were all thinking of the same thing, focused on the same thing. Verse 14 says, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, He said, it says this way, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, he was not alone. He had someone with him. Praise the name of the Lord. I would like tonight to talk to you about faith in the body. Faith in the body. You've got faith in God, but do you have faith in your brother? Do you have faith in your sister? We need faith in one another. Put your Bibles down, and I want you to ask God to tailor this message to you. Lord, what is it that we need here this evening? Lord, we want to hear your word. We want to feel your presence and your spirit. We need one another. We pray today in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you as you are seated. Amen. 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 I'm excited about Easter, aren't you? Just around the corner. My wife's favorite holiday, if you didn't know that. But Easter, exciting for this weekend. It's going to be a it's going to be a full, overflowing house of hungry people to celebrate the resurrection. Be a part of it. Don't flee from it. And um, just come early. Get a good seat. There will be extra seats out, even even more than we have now. And uh, parking, all that, just work with us. We we want to be certainly guest-friendly. And as they come in, we want to accommodate as much as we can for them to hear the gospel. Some people only come this time of year, and it's a great, great opportunity for them to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you, and there's power in the gospel of Jesus Christ. There really is. I've said it before. It's not fair that some of us have heard it a thousand, two, three thousand times, and there's some people who never heard it once. But there's power in it. And there's people that's going to hear the gospel for the very first time this coming Sunday, and we ought to be excited about that. Amen. Amen. I get right to the word of the Lord tonight. The day of Pentecost is a significant day. It was 50 days after the Passover. It was the fulfillment, it was the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy that in the last days I'm going to pour my spirit upon all flesh. Hundreds of years before this, Joel had prophesied 
that God was going to pour out his spirit. When God poured out his spirit in the book of Joel, in the book of Acts, you will find that something significant happened. God chose the place, he chose the people, and he chose the atmosphere. Amen. He chose Jerusalem for he said in the book of Luke, he told his disciples, he said, he said, you're going to be in due with power from on high, beginning at Jerusalem. He said, I want you to go there. I want you to go there and tarry for the promise of the Father. He chose where? We will find in Acts chapter 1, he chose who? His disciples, those that were on Mount of Olives. He told them to go. There were many that followed him, but Acts 1 tells us that there were 120 that were there on the day of Pentecost. I will say to you, he knew exactly how many would be there on the day of Pentecost. Because this day known as Pentecost was celebrated was celebrated in a holiday known as Pentecost or the Feast of Weeks. Which you go back to the Old Testament. You'll find that when the lamb was slain in Egypt to get them out. Out of Egypt, and the blood was put on the doorpost. Known became known as a feast they would celebrate every year, known as the Passover. But fifty days after they come out of Egypt, they were in Mount Sinai, and that's where the law was given. And on that day, there were a hundred and twenty that that began to sound with the trumpet, and the law was given in Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain. And when the voice of God spake from the top of the mountain, there was a great thundering and a great thundering voice of God. Smoke was on the top of that mountain. It was an upper place that God gave his word. You know how many died that day because they didn't listen to the law? 3,000. So when you come to the day of Pentecost, you will find that it was the celebrated day of the law given at Mount Sinai. Are you all with me tonight? Amen. How many trumpeters were there at, at Sinai? 120. How many are in the upper room? 120. How many people died at the bottom of Mount Sinai? 3,000. How many were added to the church on the day of Pentecost? 3,000. God knew exactly what he was doing. He knew where it would happen and who it would happen with, and he certainly knew when it was going to happen. God chose this day for himself to pour his spirit. And where in the Old Testament, Mount Sinai, the law was given, that's where we get the Ten Commandments and the law, the Levitical law, what was written in the book of Exodus. We get the law that was written on stone. Can I say to you today, on the day of Pentecost, the, the law was written in the heart of man. And out of the abundance of the heart of man, they begin to speak. And when they were filled with the Holy Ghost, praise the name of the Lord, filled with the Holy Ghost, they begin to speak with other tongues. Let me, let me, I'm getting ahead of myself just a little bit. But when you find in Acts chapter 2, he knew there would be 120. He knew where. He knew when. Did he not? He knew who. But I'm going to say this. He knew how. He was going to pour his spirit out on 120 that were in one accord. That meant they were all focused on the same thing. Every single person on the day of Pentecost was looking for the baptism of of the Holy Ghost. Everybody there were desiring the outpouring of his spirit, which was known as the promise of the Father. I want to stop here for a moment and say, there is something very powerful in a church when everybody there is focused and hungry for the same thing. Something happens when everybody at church are looking for the Lord to touch their life. Amen. I don't want to come to church and my mind be on yesterday or something I've got to do this week. When I'm at the house of God, I want my mind on the Lord. I want my mind on what Jesus is going to do in my life, my family. Amen. It's powerful. You can have a bigger crowd and have a less powerful atmosphere. In cards, they say that four of a kind beats a full house. Is that true? I'm not much of a card player, but that's what they tell me. Is that You're afraid to admit it in here. I'm not talking about gambling. I'm just talking about a card game. Four of a kind beats a full house. How many's ever heard that? I will apply that even to church. When you've got four people focused on the same thing, it is more powerful than a bunch of people that's focused on a lot of different things. 
it's that way in a family. It's that way with a business. It's a business principle. You got everybody doing their own thing and nobody's focused on the same goal. You will find it becomes disunified and the atmosphere becomes contentious. That's right. When the Bible says in Psalms 133, how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Amen. You know what he said? He said, for there have I commanded my blessing. Where? Not people together, but people unified. He said, you know how you're going to know that they are my disciples? Because they love one another. It's amazing when somebody gets blessed and the spirit of the unity is, is in a church. And somebody gets blessed and somebody hears about God has blessed them. And they're just overjoyed that somebody got blessed. Instead of, didn't happen to me. I didn't get the raise, didn't get the promotion, didn't get to sing, didn't get to play, didn't get to preach, and whatever it is. And that, that's, that becomes disunified, pride. When there's contention in a family, contention in a home, contention in a church, wherever it might be. The Bible says, only by pride cometh contention. And I don't have to ask all of you individually because I think probably everybody in the room that's ever been around people of any group, you understand what I'm going to tell you. Contention is something that you can feel. You can feel contention. You can walk into a room, not know what the conversation is going, and not even see the facial expression and knows it's tense in this room. Anybody ever, you know what I'm talking about? Amen. You can feel tension. You can feel it because it sets a certain atmosphere in the room. God will not move in a house that's contentious. God can't bless a family that's contentious. He can't bless a church that's contentious. Just for the record, I don't feel any contention. But I'm just teaching you here tonight, and it's Wednesday night. People on Wednesday night, everybody wants to be here. That's right, it's powerful. You, you could have stayed home for whatever reason. Busy week, we're all working jobs. You, you have full schedules and families. You could have been anywhere you wanted to, but you're here tonight. I understand what I'm saying. There's no contention in the building. And what I'm teaching you tonight is because we believe in one another. The Bible says, weep with them that weep and rejoice with them that rejoice. When somebody's hurting, oh, you hurt with them. You, you want to reach and pick them up because you want them to be strengthened. And when somebody's blessed, you want to rejoice with them. If it's somebody's family getting married or somebody gets blessed or if it's a funeral, oh, my goodness, you hurt. Why? Because we are one body. We are members in particular. We all have different, have different um, uh, roles and different, different, Bible says we're different members and different giftings. But you know what? My, it, it's like the thumb and the toe. It's like the eye and the ear. It's all part of something that has a specific role. Amen. The Bible says don't let the eye, the, 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 the hand should say to the, foot, to the foot, I don't need you. Amen. The eye should say to the ear, you don't need me. Amen. We need each other. And when you can look across the aisle and say, that's my sister. That's my brother. Oh, I, I miss them. I don't know where they were last week. Even tonight, Sister Ross is unable to be here because she is sick. We want to pray for her. But we miss that she's not here. And others that have passed on and moved on, amen, have went on to heaven. We wish they were here tonight. There are others that are not here that have, for whatever reason, have went away from the Lord. And there's something in us that grieves with them. Oh, we wish they were back in church. How many know what I'm talking about? When we opened the church after six weeks of COVID, we opened the church after six weeks of trying to follow mandates. And we can, oh, I don't even like the word anymore. Mandates, trying to follow mandates and trying to be safe and work through all of the things and, and uh, just, and also trying to protect the view of the church. And we call, we, we would, uh, it, it was a little bit strict in here even in this area. But uh, it was it was during that time we had some that, that came to help us because we, thank God we had live stream. Y'all remember Finn's swinging into the picture and out of the picture? Y'all remember that? We do Bible studies from our living room. Oh, yeah, yeah, that was fun, fun times. And uh, I preached to a camera a lot. I, I, I really did preach to a camera a lot. But I'll never forget after people that all of their life they've been in the house of God, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesdays, revival services, 
and Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesdays for their life. And then all of a sudden, they can't go to church on Sunday. They can't go to church on Wednesday. And, and they come in, and I open the door for a few that were, you know, they limited how many you could even have in a building, how far. They even called me and asked me if we sang in church. They called from the health department. Pastor Bounds, did you all sing on Sunday? Yep. They didn't want us to sing. They did. Well, we need everybody in, in, within 10 feet of this particular person. You know, it was, it was, and I realize people in the health department, some of those working just were doing what they were told to do. I'm not coming to be critical here tonight. But there was a limit in how many we could allow. But I watched people that came in here that helped with different things to, so we could get the gospel out and keep you preach too and hearing the word of the Lord. I mean, no, it, there's a, a cheeseburger won't feed your soul. But the word of the Lord, amen. Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceeded out of the mouth of God. And I, I got up and we preached the word of the Lord. And I watched as some, we were practicing music, a song. And I watched one service one practice before we ever turned the cameras on, the power of God came here. I watched people fall to their knees. And one saint said, I just wanted to kiss the ground of the church. It was just good to be home. Amen. And I had people that said that one of the greatest things when we had church again was when they could look. We weren't supposed to shake hands. If you did, you had to. Why am I going backwards four years? I don't know here. But they, they you know, you wanted to uh, uh, make sure your hands were clean. Don't shake hands. And. My goodness, they sold out of rubber gloves and I mean, know what I'm talking about. They did all over the country. There was a shortage of everything. And, and But I had people to tell me, they said, just to be at church and see people that, that, that pray and worship God like I do, it was strengthened to me. I just want you to know, we do need one another. We need one another. We need one another. You need each other. You know what you can't substitute? You can't substitute a church service with video stream. You can't substitute it. I realize you need it every now and then, but there's power of being together. There is something about two or three gathering together my name. There I am in the midst of them. Come on, I'm preaching to you right now. There's something about gathering together. And the Bible says in the... Amen. Would you put book of uh, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25 I want to throw this up there tonight the book of Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25 man look what it says it says I believe this is commandment it says not forsaking the assembly what are we doing tonight we're assembling we got children in one area we got youth in another area we got different classes on Wednesday nights but we are assembling together he said, don't forsake the assembling of, of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Do you realize the pastor, the preacher, the evangelist, they have a role of edifying the body, preaching and bringing understanding, but you know that we edify one another. Some of the greatest sermons I've ever heard preached were not from the pulpit. It was from the seat. Because I knew the crisis that you had just come out of. And I watched you stand before the Lord and lift up your hands and say the Lord is still good. Watch you through the troublesome times of life. See the goodness of God when it looks like the rug was pulled out from under you. But yet you still had faith that God knows the way that I take. I preach to you, saints. I know you're looking at a pulpit tonight, but every now and then you've got to look across the aisle. You've got to look at the seat behind you and realize if God brought them through it, he's going to bring me through it. If God did this for them, he's going to do it for me. If God healed their family, he's going to heal my family. If he brought their prodigal back, he's going to bring my my children back. God's not a respecter of persons. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Growing up in church, I absolutely, my entire life, I can't say I've never been hurt by a believer. I can't say that I've never been done wrong by a preacher. I've been in this 45 years of my life. I can't say to you tonight that the assembly of the believer has been perfect because it's not. There are people in this room and maybe it was perfect until you got here. Amen. 
before I got here. You know what I'm saying. Amen. Until you got here, it may have been perfect, but because you're here and I'm here, it brings imperfection because all of us know that we're not perfect. But I'm going to tell you something I can say before God and before every believer in this room, and it's awesome to, to pastor believers. It's nothing like it, people that believe in the word of the Lord and Almighty God. But I'll stand before you and tell you I have always loved the church, the ecclesia, the brought out of the world. People that separated themselves from sin to trust him and to trust his word to obey it and live a life that God had intended for them. I've loved it since, since I was a little boy and, and Sunday school teachers would teach us. and I've loved them. Some of them, just a few years ago, one told me, she said, she called me, they called me little Aaron when I was little. They call me brother Aaron now when they see me. They said, brother Aaron, I pray for you every single day of your life. I pray for you every day. They must know I need it. Something about having people that care for you. This is not a Sunday, Wednesday thing. This is a Sunday through Sunday thing. You don't give up on people when they fail. You don't, you don't, you don't give up on people when they make a mistake. Amen. I say it often. We believe forgiveness for the sinner. But do you believe forgiveness for the saint? There's still people that are imperfect try, try, trying to strive for perfection. I say to you, let's not be judgmental when somebody slips. The Bible says, ye who are spiritual, reach down and restore such a one. They're still your brother. They're still your sister. Somebody say amen. Hallelujah the power of the church and I've grown to love the church even more as I get older there's nothing like being in the church there's nothing like being in the church there's nothing like being here on a Wednesday night I want you to say the power of presence you know when God comes in you can feel his presence because it, it exemplifies the fruit of the spirit when the spirit of the Lord moves in you're going to feel hope Oh, yes, like a light comes on. You feel warmness in your spirit. You know what's God. You'll feel love and joy and peace and gentleness and kindness and faith. And Man, it, when God moves in the building, and I'm going I'm to say this right now, I don't want a church service without his presence. I want to feel him. And I'll say it this way, I want to feel what I feel on Sunday, on Monday, in my living room, in my, my children's bedroom, in my house, wherever I'm at. I want God to be in the dining room of my home, in the car that I drive. I want to feel Him. It's the power of God's presence. Where two or three are gathered together, there I am in the midst of them. Where any two or three will agree, He said, I'll do it. There's power in agreement. And I want to also say to you, it's not just the presence of God that we need. We need the presence of friends, the presence of believers, the presence of one another. I stayed in his home. He he was a he was a recent widow, brother brother Brown and sister Brown. He he was a recent widow. His wife of maybe 30 years had died and and uh, left behind a, a little boy that was three years old and I was a young evangelist and went and stood went and stayed in, in his house and all the pictures were up all, all the decorations of hers was still there you walked in there was a there was a there was a sadness that was there because it had been so recent a little boy named Andy and and if I remember right I got him a little he, he, he not too long after and went down a few years I remember buying him a little knife that his dad would govern I was probably too young to get him a knife, but I thought every young boy ought to have a knife from where I come from. And um, But I, I remember little Andy being there and just dad and Andy, mom's gone, the wife is gone. And we were sitting around one night, just fellowship. There was no screens in the room. There was no television to take the time. We just sit around and ate good food and hung out. And I'll never forget what he told me and the warmness of the conversation. He said, you know, but Aaron... Because when I started preaching, when people said, Brother Browns, I turned around and looked for my dad. And uh, he said, you know, Brother Aaron, he said, uh, when I was at the funeral and, and uh, had lost my wife, he said, he said, many people come by and said many things at the casket. He said, but there was one man that was there that gave me more strength than anybody else that was in the room. And he said, the man that gave me more strength 
was somebody that never said anything to me during the funeral or the, or the viewing. I said, really? I said, uh, how is that? He said, because he had been through what I was going through. Most people in, in this room, you don't know what to say when someone loses a family member. And I would say, I would hope that if somebody on this side of the church lost a family member dear to their heart, that people on this side of the church and behind, front and back of them would show up at that funeral and just say, I'm praying for you. We don't know what to say. Probably the worst thing you can say is, I understand. Because you probably don't. But you don't know what to say. How many ever been there? You wanted to say something, but you didn't know what to say. Can I say to you, you don't have to say anything. Because there's power in your presence. When you walk in the room and you are a believer, you walk in with the grace of God that's in your spirit, atmospheres change. There ought to be such a demeanor about you that people want to hire, hire you because of what they feel when you're in the interview. Come on, I'm not by myself. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you even until the end of the world. God's not something we pick up on Sunday and drop off before we leave the parking lot and we go on our own Monday. Oh, no. He is with me. He is with me me. When I go on the funeral, he's there. When I go in the hospital and pray for somebody, he's with me. Come on, when you show up in town, he's with you. Oh, I might as well talk about it. When, you, when you're sitting down at the dining table with your friend, your family, and the waitress is having a bad day, they forgot your order two times. They brought you the wrong drink. They, the, the meal was cold. It wasn't what you were paying for. And all of a sudden, you show uh, 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 everything but grace. Can I tell you, I don't want people at that moment to see me act up in my flesh. I want people at that moment to see warmness and grace and say, you know what, it's okay. Because you probably got good food at home anyhow. But you know what? In that moment they see grace and they see forgiveness and they, they see a demeanor. Because I'm telling you, I've been in restaurants where people ring those, re those waiters and waitresses. Leave them standing there crying. But not a Holy Ghost filled Christian should be that way. There ought to be something about you're the best table they've had all day. Oh, am I preaching to anybody here tonight? Something happened when you walked in that jail cell and you opened up your Bible and started talking about the goodness of God. They felt something in that moment they haven't felt in years of their life. What is it? I've got something with me that's greater than I am. It's the presence of Almighty God. I say to you today, we need one another. I want everybody to say, we need one another. Oh man, with something good, you ought to celebrate it. Praise God. You think you're not needed at church? Just think of it. I was up here preaching to nobody. My poor wife, my kids, and I have to be here. Amen. No, we're, we're, I mean, we're in a full house. That comes with you being here. The Bible says Peter's standing up with the 11. You know why? He wasn't, he wasn't doing this alone. When he stood on the day of Pentecost, was going to preach one of the most most powerful messages, foundational messages in all of history. He stood up there, and here was 11 other disciples standing with him. You know what it did for him? It strengthened him. To do what? To do what God had called him to do. When Jesus would send his disciples out, he sent them out in twos and threes. Why? There's power in your presence, not just his presence. We need one another. Come on, is it not church lingo or is it church lingo? We call somebody and say, will you, will you join me in prayer? Will you pray with me about this situation? Come on now. We can pray with one another. Will you just agree? I'm telling you, I grew up in this. Will you agree with me? Oh, yes, we are in agreement together that God is going to make a way for you and your family. God's going to make a way. Sister Ashley, I come back to you because of something you shared about somebody in your family that needs, needs a miracle in their life. You know what we did? We agreed together because there's power in having somebody agreeing with you. Don't you try to walk this road alone. Judas did, and he became a betrayer of the one he's supposed to be serving. Alone is not good. Join with somebody next to you. I want you to look at two or three people and say, I need you in my life. Hey, go ahead and tell them they're looking good tonight. Would you do that? We need strengthened and edified. Amen. 
You ever just stop and try to meet somebody new at church? Church should be the happiest place in town. I've heard preacher after preacher step up, step up here and says the best thing going in town. I believe it. Hasn't always been what I've felt in churches I've been at. But here there's a warmness of his spirit. A welcoming person at the door that smiles and says, so glad you're here. Don't walk up to a guest and say, well, praise the Lord. Just one time, I want somebody to say, praise the Lord to me, and I just start dancing right there. Amen. That's a Christian way of saying hello. Just hello, so glad you're here. I mean it. So glad to see you. Missed you on Wednesday. Missed you on Sunday. We need one another. If your spouse didn't show up tonight, you'd be worried about them. If your kids didn't come home tonight, you'd be worried about them. You know why? They're a part of your family. It ought to be the same in the house of God. I'm a part of believers. We are joined together. Somebody say amen. In the book of Philippians chapter 4, and so believing in one another is very, very key. Living a life that can be believed in is very key. Living what you preach is very key. I want it to be that when you walk into the place, people are happy to see you. Why? Because you exemplify the nature of Christ. Everybody say the power of presence. Philippians chapter 4 verse 1, Paul writes to the church in Philippi. He says, therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and longed for. You see, you see the terminology? He loves the body. These are believers now in Philippi, and you can see the book of Acts. I tell you what, read the book of Acts. Read it through all the way from front to begin. And think about the gospel going to a village of heathens. Go to go study Corinth and find the wickedness of idolatry and their practices. It was unbelievable what they would do. But yet he went and stood and preached in Corinth. And God built a mighty church there because the Lord said, I want you to go there for I have, I have many people that are there. You know what the Lord knew? He knew people were going to respond to the preaching of the gospel. Paul admonished and loved the church. I, I say this tonight. If you, if you have any relationship at any point with anybody, you're going to find a moment they disappoint you. Let me know that's true. Just get married. I'm not saying it about my wife. She's perfect in all her ways. Just have children. Have parents. Join a company. I'm not talking about her. Y'all still dwelling there. I'm moving on. Amen. Just You're going to have disappointing moments. Somebody told me one time, they said they've been married 20 years. They said, we've never argued. I thought, mm-hmm. I didn't believe it. And when you begin to understand, that doesn't mean that we have a disagreement, that I don't love her, admonish her. She's my favorite person in the world. Have we always got along? Have we always agreed? Do we see everything eye to eye? No, I'm a guy. She's a woman. You work through things. But it doesn't mean we don't value one another. In the church, there's going to be disagreements. There's going to be times of disappointments. But he writes, therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown. So stand, what? Fast in the Lord, my, de- my dearly beloved. He's talking about the body of believers. He said, I beseech. He said, uh, Yodius and beseech Syntyche uh, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. He's addressing two different women that are in the body of believers that are here in Philippi. Two different women that it appears maybe there's, there's some contention between them. He said, I 
want them to be of the same mind in the Lord. Of one accord. You know why? Because if you get a relationship long enough, it's possible that disagreements are going to come in. Paul was mighty preaching through the scripture. You'll find that many women converted under his ministry. Just go to Acts 16 and see Lydia. You got a powerful lady that came a silver or purple. You haven't turned me off, have you? Are y'all with me right now? And um, when you go and see that Lydia converted, it's not long that another woman came, but she had a different tongue. She spoke truth, but with a bad spirit. The Bible says she was a woman of divination. And Paul was able to address the issue. Here it appears that Paul is addressing maybe some contention or things of that nature. Because he said, I beseech Yodius and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoked fellow. Watch how he's writing. We are linked together. Would y'all just say yoked fellow? I doubt you've ever said that in your life unless you was reading the Bible out loud. He said, help those women which labored with me in the gospel. With Clement also, which many believe he became a bishop. And with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. They're in this like we are. They're going the same direction as we are. He said, I want you to rejoice in the Lord sometimes. When should you rejoice? When things are perfect. No, 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 no. When people disappoint you. When the spouse hasn't met your expectations. When the children children seem they've lost their mind. What he said was, it doesn't matter what's going on in your life. Rejoice in the Lord always. And he said, and again I say, rejoice. Amen. Praise him anyhow. When the doctor doesn't give you the report that you wanted, Anyhow, I'm going to praise him anyhow because no matter when my world seems to be disappointing, God is still good. He is good all the time. I'm not coming to church with an attitude. I'm coming to church with gratitude. I'm just glad my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Oh, clap your hands and praise the Lord right now. Amen, amen. Let your moderation be known unto all men. What was he saying? Don't live in such a high standard to make everybody think you're holier than what you really are. That your level of holiness is not attainable. He said, live a moderate life. He said, the Lord is at hand. Verse 6, here it goes. Are you ready? Buckle your seatbelts. I've only got a few minutes, but let's take this ride together. He said, be careful for nothing, but in everything. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. He said, don't be anxious about anything. He said, be prayerful and seek the will of God. You know why he writes this? Because in chapter 3, he talks about going through things. A man that has written, this is toward the end of his ministry, but a man that has written most of the books in the New Testament, he says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, He said, that I may know him. Oh, no matter how long you've been in the church, no matter how long you've been saved, you might be older than me and have the Holy Ghost longer than me, but it doesn't mean you've got an excuse not to continue to know God. I want to know him. Somebody shout, I want to know him. I want to get to know him. Come on, he threw stars off of his fingertips. He spoke and the thunder rolled. He clapped and the lightning flashed. The heavens and the heavens of heavens cannot contain him. I don't want to be content with some small knowledge of God. I want to know him. I want to seek him. Somebody say amen. He said that I may know him. He goes on and writes in verse 13. He said, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. He said, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth into the things which are before. He said, I've done things I'm ashamed of. I've come from places I wish that I'd never been. He said, I'm forgetting what I did. I can't live in the mistakes of yesterday. I can't live in what somebody did to me yesterday. 
I can't live my life in unforgiveness of what somebody did seven or eight or ten or twenty years ago. I can't stay there. It will apprehend me. It will hold me back. He said, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to reach for the things that are before. I'm not letting the chaos or confusion or the tragedy keep me from what God has today and tomorrow. I'm moving on. I'm moving on. I'm forgetting about the trouble. And I'm moving on. Can I say to you, you can move on. God has something better for you than pain. God has something better for you than offense and bitterness. Your best days are ahead of you, not behind you. Oh, when somebody would help me preach for a minute, God has something better for you. Hallelujah. I don't want, I, I don't want to sound at all of any level of unbelief in anybody here. But the Bible does say that some are going to fall away. Some are going to depart from the faith. I realize not everybody I've ever pastored is still here. I understand that. And I can live in regret. I can live in remorse. And Paul addresses this in chapter 3. He says, he says in verse 17 of Philippians 3, watch what he says. And I'm teaching you tonight about needing one another and having faith in one another. Watch what he says in verse 17. Brethren, be followers together. You've got to follow together. Not by yourself, but together. You have a spouse in this room right now. You ought to be thankful. You've got somebody walking with you together. Following the things of God. And he, he goes on and says, uh, together of me and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example and he says, for as many, for, he explains, he said, for many walk of whom I have told you often and, and, and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. He was saying that they're, they're, they're no longer for what they used to believe in. They're now talking against the doctrine that they used to believe in. That They're, they're now enemies of the cross of Christ. They, they, they once were in it, but now bitterness has got a hold of their life. And he goes on and says, verse 19, whose end is destruction. He said, I'll write you weeping. He doesn't say, I'll write you glad that they're going to be destroyed. No, because we used to walk together, but they're not walking. They're not in the church now. I've been in here 20 years. I wish to goodness everybody had a powerful experience in this altar and in this church. We're still in the church, but they're not. We heard the preacher preach on Monday night about Satan taking advantage through unforgiveness. And I've seen it many, many times. You want to give the devil access? Don't forgive. Did you hear, Pastor, tonight? It's biblical. Everybody ought to go back and listen to Monday night's message. It was powerful. Hallelujah. I will stay stand here and tell you, I've never felt the atmosphere of our church better than what it is right now. There is such powerful unity. I'm not preaching at anybody or against anybody. You know that tonight. I'm just telling you, I feel like God's about to command his blessing here. We are destined to double. You're going to see more than you've ever seen. God's going to do mighty things. Amen. Hallelujah. He goes on and says, those that are no longer here, whose end is destruction, verse 19, whose God is their belly, meaning whatever they feel of their desire, their flesh, that's what they're going to do. He said, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. He said, but our conversation matters. For our conversation is where? On what God wants it to be in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I can't let the failure of one keep me looking for the Savior of one. I can't let somebody I trusted that slipped away. I can't let somebody I used to, in my, in my family, friendship, people I used to preach meetings with, people I've even traveled with that are no longer living for God. Can I tell you, I can't let what somebody did with their experience with God keep me from looking for my experience with Him. He said, where's our conversation going to be? It cannot be talking about people that walked away. It's got to be seeing the people that are still here. It's got to be seeing the things that God. I'm telling you, just because somebody fell away doesn't mean God's not going to send more, that there's going to be a great harvest and out. And you know what you do? You just keep looking for them to come home. You keep praying for them to return. Is it discouraging? Yes. But I'm going to forget some things and start expecting some things. Oh, clap your hands and praise him. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. 
Can I preach for just a few more minutes? What do you do when you have a crisis? What do you do when somebody disappoints you? What do you do when things did not meet your level of expectation? What do you do when the pastor let you down? What do you do when the saint let you down? What do you do when the spouse let you down? I'm going to tell you what to do because he writes about it. He said, be careful for nothing. He said, don't be anxious about it. Keep praying. Chapter 4, verse 6. Somebody shout, keep praying. He said, but in everything by prayer. And supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. Oh, yeah. He said, preceding this, rejoice in the Lord always. It doesn't matter what's fallen away. It doesn't matter what I've come out of, what I went through. The Lord is good. He's good all the time. He's good in the morning. He's good in the evening. He's good the noonday. He's good all night long. I said, the Lord. Somebody shout, the Lord is good. Stand to your feet and clap your hands and say, rejoice. In the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I feel like we got a word from the Lord tonight. Come on, tell a couple people around you, God is good. All the time. Somebody shout, God is good. When you're not, amen. You didn't see that coming. Somebody shout, God is good. When you disappoint me. We need one another. But we certainly need to be praising him. He's never let me down. He's never failed me one time. If you will rejoice in the Lord always, and you will be, don't be careful for nothing. That means you, you, can't, you can't become cynical. I don't know if I can trust. I don't know if they're going to stay. I don't know if this is going to happen. I don't know. Listen, you, you, you can't. Listen. You, if, if a person from West Virginia does you wrong, you can't think everybody from West Virginia is wrong. If one person from Columbus does you wrong, you can't think everybody that lives in Columbus is going to do you wrong. If a person of some ethnicity does you wrong, you can't think everybody that ethnicity is going to do you wrong. If one preacher does you wrong, it doesn't mean every preacher is going to do you wrong. If one saint does you wrong, it doesn't mean every saint is going to do you wrong. Be careful for nothing. But you approach everything with prayer, supplication. What am I going to do with this? I'm going to pray. How? With thanksgiving. God's good. I made my mind up. I am not going to let my heart get hard. I'm not going to become cynical and think nobody wants it. You know why? Because I've seen a ton of people that want the Lord. Here it is. You know what follows this? Verse 7. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, doesn't make sense how I'm going to be going through what I'm going through but I feel like it's going to be alright if I start not believing in people I'm not going to have peace if you give me a person if you give me a person that doesn't believe in people I'll show you somebody that has no peace in their life but you give me somebody, somebody that's said that was in the past God's got this I'm praying through it I'm going to, I'm going to go to church and rejoice I don't want anybody, I don't want heaven to look down at me or anybody to look down and can tell my level of worship based upon what I'm going through. Let it be the same all the time. Enters gates with thanksgiving, has no stipulation of your, the perfection of your world. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I'm 45. The most valuable thing in my life is peace of God. Somebody say amen. amen. Finally. Sounds like the end of the sermon. Somebody say finally. 
He's wrapping up his sermon. This is, this is altar call time. Are you ready? Can I have five more minutes? I just said that to say it. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. You know what you do? I'm not letting that situation pull my mind. I choose to think on things that are just, honest, true, pure. I'm telling you, you got to control your mind. I'm not letting my mind go there. I'm letting my mind go on these things. I want you to take verse 8 for the next week. I want you to, I want you to think over it and say, I'm going to choose what I think about. Are you getting what I'm preaching? It matters what you think about. You feed your mind trash, you're going to think trash. You feed your mind fear, you're going to think fear. You feed your mind conspiracies, you're going to think unbelief and doubt. You won't believe in anybody. Best thing you can do is turn every screen off in your life and get in the Word and stay there for about three weeks or a month. You'll start believing. You'll feel the peace of God. You want to forgive people in your world. Man, I feel this. You better be careful to think the wrong way because you'll start attracting things that are the way you're thinking. All of a sudden, somebody's going to drop in your eye message having conversations with somebody that's not holy feeding something that's not right oh I feel that today be careful because you'll let something feed into your spirit that creates destruction in your life everybody shout but God is going to help me change my thoughts he said those things verse 9 which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do I say do if you're in the building today and you feel like you've been apprehended do you know that the angel of the Lord walked up with Simon Peter when he was imprisoned opened up the jail cells went in there, took the chains off and this is what he said put your shoes on he could have just put his shoes on the angel touched him and said put your shoes on you know why? because you've got to do something you're coming out of this jail cell. You're coming out of this issue. You're coming out of this offense. Put your shoes on. You've got you've to determine, I'm going to do it. I'm not just going to hear the counsel. I'm going to obey the counsel. I'm not just going to hear what God's going to do. I'm going in the direction of what God is going to do. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, everybody say do. And the God of peace. Day, doesn't matter. Just because one church did you wrong doesn't mean they're all going to do you wrong. Let me know it's true. Don't let the guy with the southern accent that did you wrong think I'm going to do you wrong because I have a southern accent. It's called stereotyping. Putting people in a category. It's not the will of God. The Lord dealt with me about this today. It is time to believe again. You'll do what I preached, and you're going to have to go back unless you take notes and listen to it again because I talked about several points. You will have peace. You will have peace. God wants you to have peace in your mind and in your heart, and it's going to pass all understanding. Would you lift your hands and ask God to speak to you? The Bible said lift your heart with your hands, Lord. On this Wednesday night, help us, God, to do your will. Hallelujah. Come on, Paul. Come on, saint of God. I'm not going to let anything. 
I'm not going to let anything in my past keep me from the good things in my future. I'm going to try again. I'm going to believe again. Lord, speak to us. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I want you to make a commitment. I'm going to start trusting again. I'm moving on. I've, I've had people to hurt me, but not everybody's going to hurt me. In this room tonight, God wants to set you free. If you're here today and you have been wounded by a circumstances in the past, a circumstance of the past, would you raise your hand? I see so many hands up today. If you're here in the building, you've been hurt by somebody you're afraid to trust again, just raise your hand. I'm, nobody's looking around, but Pastor, can I say today you're normal? You're not an anomaly because you lost trust. But you can't live in that forever. I'm going to tell you about somebody tonight that will never fail you. And it's Jesus. Jesus will give you hope and peace and joy and strength. I promise you, he'll give, open your heart. And open the door to the Lord. He's going to change everything in your life. You're going to have something you can't get from anywhere else. It's the peace of God. It's the joy of the Lord. God wants to do that in this room right now. If you're here and you want God to heal some things on the inside, I want you to make your way to this altar tonight. I want you to come up here and pray. We're going to pray with you. I know I want to pray with you. I believe God wants to do something all over this building. This is your first service. If this is somewhere you've been a part of the church for 30 years, 40 years, I want you to come. Come on. Invite somebody to come with you. God is going to move on your behalf. I'm not living in a jail cell any longer. I'm not going to be apprehended. Hallelujah. The rest of the church is going to help us pray. I want, I want ministers and prayer team to come and help me today. Today is a new day. Would you help me today? I've taught you tonight about needing one another. We're going to pray in agreement. We're going to join one another in prayer. In Jesus' name. Before we pray for them, how many of you can relate with something I've taught tonight? Oh yeah, I think everybody at some level. Disappointment in a moment. How many want peace of God in your life? I feel that coming in this room. Here tonight, everybody in the building is going to pray, not just those in the altar. But we're going to bow our heads and we're going to pray this prayer. God, I'm going to forget those things which are behind. I'm going to forget the pain of yesterday. There's some things I'm putting behind me that I'm not thinking about any longer. I'm not dwelling on that anymore. Lord, today I put it behind me because I know something. You, it's keeping me from what you have in front of me. Hallelujah. How can I move forward if I'm always looking in the past? Come on, pray this prayer, Lord. I'm asking you to forgive me for dwelling on thoughts that do not bear good fruit. God, forgive me for letting my mind go to things that no longer matter making mountains out of mole hills. God, change the way I think. God, today I make a vow. Come on, I want you to pray it. Today I'm going to dwell on what is honest, what is true. I'm going to think about pure thoughts. I am. I'm going to put my mind on the right things so I can have the peace of God. I feel the Lord right now. I want you to pray all over this building, God. My best days are ahead of me, not behind me. Lord, we need you, Jesus. Go ahead and begin to sing as we begin to pray. Would you begin to pray? Stretch your hands this way. Begin to pray for these in the altar. Lord Jesus.